Well, I have to confess, I broke my own rules. I didn't mean to. Didn't realize it. The new shirt doesn't have a pocket. <laughs> no pocket. I, I vowed I'd never buy another shirt without a front pocket, but there you go. <laughs> I guess it costs too much to put pockets on the shirt. They're extra. They're extra. Extra charge. <coughs> so anyways. I kind of like it. I think it looks good. It's a little wrinkly. Been trying to iron it out a little bit. Looks like it just stepped out of a fashion bag. Yeah. There yeah. we go. All right, well, we are now continuing our study. It looks like we're going to be doing it here for several weeks. There's a few more chapters here in James. But James chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, we're talking about the problems with partiality. It says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you sit over there, or, or you sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love it? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the mercy that's available to all of us. Lord, help us to not be hiders of the law, hiders of your word, keeping people from knowing that they can be forgiven. Lord, help us to show them that we're all in need of forgiveness and we're all able to be forgiven in Christ. Father, speak to us today. Help us to be people who aren't partial one person over another, Lord, but are merciful and gracious and loving to all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, James' concept of partiality is, is kind of a snobbery and favoritism, always based on what somebody looks like, their exterior conditions. No, no matter what the expression of favoritism, can we all agree that favoritism is wrong? Conceivably, it could be done by giving preference to the poor over the rich, since most of the people in the early church were poor, but... This isn't what James had in mind here. It wasn't the problem of his readers. His readers weren't being tempted to distrust and dislike the rich, but were in fact courting their favor by showing partiality to them. And that is contrary to faith in Christ. <clears throat> James' readers were their own examples of this sin. James kind of shows them a, a home movie if you will, of themselves so they can see their own faults. Let's, let's examine the situation he outlines here. He, he says, you know, hypothetically, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and yet, 
He knows that such a man does in fact come. The assembly mentioned here is the gathering of the church. The word your identifies this meeting as a Christian meeting. This man's fine jewelry and clothing indicate that he's obviously wealthy. In contrast to the majority of the churchgoers that wear just plain ordinary clothing. The greatest contrast, however, isn't the man's clothing, but how he's treated by the believers in the church because of what he's wearing. James describes how the believers' attitudes contrast with the fundamentals of their faith. Their arbitrary show of respect and disdain was reprehensible. It's even more distinct when we realize that the word for special attention here that he used in verse 3 is the same word used for the esteem God had for Mary in Luke 1.48, indicating his profound affection in selecting her to be the mother of Jesus. The contrast of attitudes toward the rich and the poor is, is further shown by those assembled offering the rich man a seat, <clears throat> but they tell the poor man, go we'll stand over there, or just sit down here by my feet. They don't give them the, the preferred places of where you could sit. The contrast of attitudes toward the rich and the poor is further shown by those assembled uh, just in their faces and their attitude and their way of treating people. Their, their behavior contradicted their faith in Jesus. They set themselves up as judges according to the worldly standards by which they would judge themselves, uh, actually by which they themselves would never want to be judged. They, they don't want to be judged in the way that they're judging. I don't know if you remember the comedian David Brenner. He was very popular quite a number of years ago now. Anyway, he, he came from a very poor family, but very close family. When he graduated from high school, however, he was given what he described as an unforgettable gift. Here's, here's what he said about this gift that he got. He said, some of my friends got new clothes and a few rich kids even got cars, got new cars. My father reached into his pocket and took something out. I extended my hand palm up and he let my present drop into it. A nickel. Dad said to me, buy a newspaper with that, read every word of it, then turn to the classified section and get yourself a job. <laughs> get into the world, it's all yours now, he said. David said, I always thought that was a great joke my father had played on me until a few years later when I was in the army sitting in a foxhole and thinking about my family and my life. It was then I realized that my friends had gotten only new cars and only clothes. My father had given me the whole world. What a greater gift. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father here is trying to teach us a very similar lesson. Riches Wealth, those are the important things. Don't prioritize that. Don't hobnob, don't kowtow in order to gain something from those who are wealthy. <coughs> no, God says bow, bend low, help those beneath you up. That will cause you to be truly wealthy for that will bless you in the end because that's the work God made us for. Secondly, partiality is contrary to God's purpose. Partiality goes against God's will. Look closely here at verse 5 for this truth. He wrote, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? God's choice isn't limited to the poor nor have all the poor necessarily been chosen, but James elaborates in verse 5 why the poor have dignity. He writes, they are chosen by God, they are rich in faith, they are heirs of the kingdom. If anyone deserves our special attention, he's telling us it's the poor. If anyone deserves our generosity in ministry, it's the poor. They're the specially chosen people by God. And as Lyman Beecher, a famous minister from the 1850s, once said, 
No man can tell whether he is rich or poor by turning to his ledger. It is the heart that makes a man rich. He is rich or poor according to what he is, not according to what he has. Moses was a poor man. Admittedly, he'd been raised in, in a palace on the Nile, but he was actually the son of a slave. And when God found him, he was a fugitive with a price on his head, a, a mere shepherd who was wandering on the backside of the desert, the Bible tells us. But he was rich in faith. His faith had cost him the throne of Egypt, but he was heir to a kingdom just the same. As Pharaoh discovered when Moses reappeared, armed with might and miracle, and he saw the, the true strength of a man of faith. David, we know, is a poor man, the youngest son of a rather insignificant farmer, but you know, nothing had nothing but a song in his heart and a sling in his hand, but again, he was a man rich in faith and able to proclaim that faith in the dark valley itself. And, and as, as he was heir to the kingdom of Israel, something that, that drove King Saul to frenzy, he became king, this man of faith. Jacob was a poor man. His father was rich. You know, that's very true, but he himself was a penniless nobody when he showed up at Padan Aram. was so poor that he had to sell himself as an indentured servant to his uncle Laban in order to get the, the wife he wanted. But he was rich in faith, and he had an eye on the Abrahamic covenant, and he, that was something that Esau, his brother, so discounted that he, he sold whatever rights he had to it for a bowl of stew. Jacob, however, became heir to the kingdom, and his sons became the patriarchs of the tribes and the patriarchs of the purposes of God. We could go through the entire history of Israel and, and the church you know, to show how God, throughout history, has chosen the poor of this world to accomplish his purposes down here on earth. Martin Luther was a poor man. John Bunyan was a poor man, and so were D.L. Moody and George Mueller and, and others, yet they were all rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God. And that, that's not to say that God can't and doesn't use some great and gifted men and women in this world, people who are rich and wealthy and, and have many of the gifts of this world. But they're the exception rather than the rule. It's the height of folly to despise poor people, especially poor people in the church. And, we should rather sing with Hattie E. Buell the song of the Christian poor, song titled A Child of the King. She said, I once was an outcast, stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth, but I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. Finally, the indictment is repeated here, but you have dishonored the poor me. Verse 6. James can't seem to let the matter, matter rest here. He's got to come back after it. The, the word for dishonored suggests that the, the people in the church were insulting the poor. They were shaming the poor. The same word is used to describe Jerusalem's apostles after the authorities had imprisoned them and beaten them and threatened them and thus dishonored them. Verse uh, Acts 5, 41. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that it, they had been considered worthy to suffer shame or to be dishonored for his name. The Lord also used the word when the Jews accused him of being a Samaritan and having a demon. He said, John 8, 49, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Snobbery seems to have reached epi epidemic proportions in the Jerusalem church. Evidently, James thought it necessary to, to hammer home the fact that such behavior is reprehensible behavior in a believer. And no room exists in the church for racial discrimination, for class discrimination, economic differences. No room. It's the purpose of God that our hearts be rich, mostly. Wealth is a hindrance to that. 
kind of richness. Because it tends to take first place. God must be in first place, though, in our lives instead of wealth, not, not anyone or anything else. God must be first. Next, we need to understand that partiality is not the, in the best interests of Christians. Now, it would seem that, that favoring the rich would be a smart move from a practical standpoint, doesn't it? After all, can't they tithe more? <coughs> can't they offer us more opportunities for ministry because they can provide us with the funds we need to do the ministries? Don't they have a stronger power base in the community? Well, that's probably true. Wealthy people, however, can also be the biggest problems for a church sometimes. A, a pastor related the dynamics of his church. Their weekly re receipts were astonishingly high. And despite the financial security, he said, I'd trade these finances any day for a church that was struggling financially but trusting in God as they did so. He went on to say in his church were a few men who are so wealthy that they believe they own the church and therefore tried to run it. When we recognize all that we have is God's, it's all the Lord's, it changes our perspective. We, we lose our attitude of privilege, our attitude of place, and we get down on our knees and we say, Lord, what do you want? What's your will? Rather than demanding our own will and way. And then finally this morning, we need to understand that partiality is a violation of the law of love. A violation of the law of love. The main point is that partiality violates this law. The golden rule we all know is to love our neighbors ourselves, whether our neighbor is wealthy or poor, no matter what our neighbor's like. It, it, it must be conceded that James is in no way suggesting that the wealthy man be ignored, but the, the deference to him at the expense of the poor, he's saying, is what violates the law of love. But what was Je Jesus' first experience in our world? Do you remember? Can't you still feel the chilly atmosphere of that inn? The innkeeper telling Joseph and Mary, there's no room. We've got a stable out back. This part of the story of Christ's nativity just foreshadows his later experiences. People have continued to echo that cry. No room here for you. Jesus should have the supreme place, but he's constantly made second place, given second consideration. He should dominate our lives, but we crowd him out with so many other things. Recreation our personal interests. I often feel the chilling atmosphere that I'm in as I read the gospel story. And I feel it in the house of the rich Pharisee. Jesus was a guest there, but not a supreme guest. No water. The normal greeting, the kiss, he didn't get that. No oil. He was tolerated, patronized, not worshipped. Not until the young woman came by. I feel that atmosphere in our world today. I, I fear that we might even find it in the church, and I pray I shall not find it in my own soul. James concludes our text here by pointing to God's mercy. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What a tremendous word that is, mercy. Reminds us of the person who had his photograph taken and, and wasn't satisfied with the results. He complained to the photographer, this picture, picture just doesn't do me justice. The photographer replied, sir, what you need is not justice, but mercy. That's what we all need all the time. God offers us a choice between a fair trial or a free pardon. We need to choose the pardon. We'd be wise to settle for God's mercy. <clears throat> mercy. The, world, the word of a guilty and suffering man or woman. Please mercy. 
It's the word of someone who's in the hands of another, someone who has the power to do what's requested, provide the mercy. Prejudice is just an ongoing problem. Back during the years when Archie Bunker ran the world from his recliner, he once had a debate with his neighbor about the color of Jesus' skin. Bunker's neighbor, of course, was none other than the equally opinionated but racially different George Jefferson. As they debated the issue of Jesus' skin color, Archie referred to Warner Solomon's picture of Christ. He told Jefferson, Jesus, you can see him right there, he's white. Jefferson countered, how do you know? And so Bunker declared, I saw the picture. Jefferson then diffused Archie's logic with a little twisted rationale of his own. He told his neighbor, maybe you saw the negative. <laughs> Whenever we look with eyes of prejudice, eyes partial to our own opinion, we would do well to remember this televised debate and recognize we don't always see as clearly as sometimes we think we do. Although racial prejudice has been a primary focus in the U.S. throughout our history, other prejudices are thriving and are equally as heinous. There may be a bigotry based on economic status, as we've been talking about, or educational status. We've got two graduates here today, and praise the Lord, they're going on to improve their education. That'll be a blessing to them and their families and their futures. Maybe bigotry based on appearance, vocation, gender, even politics today, to just name a few. Any bigotry is wrong, amen? All bigotry is wrong. Amen. Yet the heart of the believer isn't exempt from any of them. A blind man, an adulterous woman, and a man with a withered hand were brought before Jesus by or in the presence of the Pharisees. The Pharisees looked at these underprivileged people as opportunities to exalt themselves. Jesus saw them as opportunities for ministry, opportunities to express love and mercy. The difference was in the heart of the viewer. And this is where the problem of partiality needs to be solved. Let's ask Christ <coughs> to change our hearts today. Those avenues, those areas of prejudice, bigotry that we have let's ask him to clean that up let's ask god to reveal where it may be that we're guilty of some kind of favoritism or partiality and at the same time asking for discernment to make more accurate distinctions about how to love whom to trust when to confront james isn't saying that we must treat every soul on earth exactly the same, but we can't treat people unfairly. He is saying that, simply based on superficial prejudices and biases. If we approach each person we meet as an opportunity to demonstrate the love of God, His mercy, His grace, we'll make good progress at putting away prejudice from our midst, overcoming that kind of thing. And we'll sh show pure love, God's pure love. We need to not see a, a wealthy person or a poor person or any kind of person. We need to see someone who was created in the image of God and who needs God's love as expressed through us. Some people may already know the Lord, and we just need to join with them and praise God together. Some may not, and we may need to help them find forgiveness and salvation. Be generous enough to share the wealth we have in Christ. But we're going to sing a song. I know the one I've written down here is not the one we're going to sing because it wasn't in the book. But let's stand together. If you need to make a commitment for the Lord, just... Come forward, I'll be here to receive you. Let's all of us challenge ourselves in terms of, of what we want to do and not being partial.